Good morning everyone and welcome to this tutorial of Hand Column Optimization for Software Engineering. My name is Hector Menendez and with my colleague Carlos Cavilla Calderon we are going to present the tutorial. We are hope that you are willing to learn about how Hand Colony can be used in software engineering and more specifically can be used in automatic test generation. Let me just introduce the speakers. The speaker for this tutorial are Carlos Capilla Calderon, who is a research fellow at the Open University. He works in software engineering and he has also been working in the task hub in the resilience node. He is associated with the SEED Research Group, which is a group of software engineering. The second speaker is me, Hector Menendez. I'm a lecturer at King's College London and I've been working in machine learning, cybersecurity and software testing. My background is from mathematics and computer science, either the bachelor and the PhD and the masters. And my current uh, research interests are focused on optimization algorithms. So let me just give you an overview of what we'll see in this tutorial. First, we are going to start with an introduction about how uncolon optimization works. The idea is that we will see the different components of uncolon optimization. Several of you might be familiar with this. So if you want to skip this part of the tutorial, you just need to go uh, a bit forward to the second part. Nonetheless, because a lot of these concepts are going to be connected either with the second part when we apply uncolon optimization for software testing or with, with the last part where Carlos will explain how this is actually applied in practice, I think it's good to have a small refreshment of the different concepts of uncolon optimization. The second part is going to be focused on automatic software testing and automatic test generation. So this is when we are going to apply uncolon optimization to software engineering. And we will see different examples and different papers where it has been applied before. So in the last part, Carlos is going to show you the Isola library, a library in Java that is actually created to for uncolon optimization problem. He will give you several examples about how this library is used and how to perform uncolon optimization with the library. Okay, let's have a look to the first part of the tutorial, how uncolon optimization works. So basically, uncolon optimization is an optimization algorithm based on the behavior of uncolonies, as the name says. So what we are going to see is how we are modeling this behavior in order to create an optimization system. First, how are we inspired in order to create uncolon optimization? So, the idea comes from the foreign behavior of ants. So normally the ants start with the nest, that is where they, where they actually live, and they need to find sources of food that they are going to send back to the nest. So what the ants are going to do is to create the shortest path between the nest and the source of food. And actually they need to be smart because they need to make sure that if there's something in their way, they can actually avoid it. So this sort of path, this optimum sort of path, is going to be a process on optimization and training and press and fail that is going to allow the ants to find the best way to obtain the food from the source of food. So the ants need to communicate. They need to let, let the other ants know how they reach those specific points how they discover the source of food, etc. etc. This communication is going to be performed via pheromones. So every time that a nun is following a specific path, she's going to be leaving pheromones that are going to show the path to the other ants. What's happening then? How this can become the most optimal path? Well, we will see it a bit more later. But basically these pheromones are going to evaporate and those who are stronger that are actually stronger because more ants has been following it, are going to be the ones that are going to define the shortest path. So basically, this methodology, which is very natural, is going to allow ants to find the shortest path. If you think about this as an evolutionary process, it makes sense that these ants that has this methodology to find the shortest path between the source of food and the nest are the ones that are more willing to survive, because they are the ones that have faster access to the food source, so they will be more willing to 
to be fitted during winter times, etc., etc., because of this idea of following each other via pheromones. In this image, we just have a very clear example about pheromone communication. So imagine that two ants are following two different paths. One is just taking a longer path to the source of food, and the other one is taking a shortest path. And the other ants that come after that start following them. So if the pheromones are stronger in a path, an ant is more likely to follow that specific path. That is, the pheromones are weaker. If the path is shorter, the ants will have more time to leave pheromones in that path. In both cases, we are going to assume that the ants have found the source of food and they have came back. So we have one that is following a longer path and one that is following a shorter path. And the other ants are just following, with the probability depending on the level of pheromones of each path. In the longer path, the ants are taking longer to go far to go to the source of food and come back. So the pheromones during that process are going to be evaporated. However, in the shortest path, the pheromone is going to be more intense because more ants have time to go and come back. And that actually is going to produce that the longer path is going to be less likely to be used. So meaning that the pheromones that are already there are going to evaporate faster, while the pheromones in the shortest path are going to accumulate faster. In this case, the longer path will disappear at some point, and the ants are only going to follow the shortest path. So that's actually very interesting, because now we have a natural process that allows us to find shortest path, and if we will just use ants inside of computers, we will be able to optimize a lot of things, but obviously that's not the case. So now is when people decide to ask, can we actually model this in a specific kind of algorithm? And actually, Dorigo, Paratita, and Susel started to do that when they started to work in colony optimization. So what they did is to say, okay, now we have the foraging behavior of ants, we know how the ants work, how can we transform this into an algorithm, how can we represent the pheromone matrices, the environmental conditions, and the ants themselves inside of a normal algorithmic system. So, if you want to know a bit more about how all these processes work, how these processes have been modeled, I recommend you this paper of Ancolon Optimization that actually can give you a wider overview of all the problems of Ancolon Optimization. Let's start with the interesting part. How this was modeled. Basically, we have three main components. We have the pheromones, as I mentioned. We need to define the path. We need to define how the ant is going to move. So for that, we are going to use a graph. Basically, a graph approach that is going to define the different steps that the ant can do. One of the nodes will be the source of food, or several of the nodes, depending on how you want to model the problem. And the other node, or other nodes, are going to be the nest. And basically, you just need to find the optimum path between the nest and the source of food. The ants are going to start in the nest, and they are going to follow different options until they find the source of food. Pheromones are going to be left by the ants in the different parts of the graph. But this is going to be modeled with a matrix of pheromones. So you will have a weight inside of the edges of the graph that is going to tell you the level of pheromones for its possible path. We will see a bit more about this in a few minutes. Also, we will have another component that is the level of difficulty from moving from one point to the next. And this is going to be defined by the heuristic. You can see that this is a meta heuristic algorithm. So basically, it's going to be leveraging the heuristic in order to make decisions. But it also has a learning part that is going to be inside of the pheromones. So the heuristic is going to be like the static component, and the pheromones is going to be the dynamic component. The pheromones are going to be constantly changing, and they are going to be evaporating, they are going to be accumulating, they are going to be giving you a learning process inside of this, while the heuristic is supposed to be static. The heuristic is not supposed to change. So how this is going to work? So we have our ant, and the ant is in a specific point of the graph. And there are two things that the ant needs to take into account. 
one of the things is the heuristic, and the other thing is the thermals. So as I said, the heuristic is going to be static, so this is just going to be a component of the probability that the ant has of following a specific path. In, in contrast, the pheromone is going to be dynamic, so it's going to be changing. So maybe some paths at the beginning are not so interesting, but then because they are shorter, because of some constraint or some obstacles that the ant is finding, they are going to be a bit more interesting for the ant. So this is going to be evolving during the learning process uh, with different ants. So basically, the ant is going to have a probability of following a path related to the heuristic and a probability of following a path related to the pheromones. So these probabilities are going to be uh, accumulated and the end is going to make the decision depending on this accumulation. There are going to be parameters on this, so sometimes you give more relevance to the heuristics, sometimes you leave more relevance to the pheromones, but no matter what the parameters are, this is going to be the whole structure. The end is going to depend on this two. Sometimes you don't even have a heuristic, sometimes the graph has some constraints that allow you to uh, ignore the heuristic, but in this case we assume that in the general overview of the problem you will have both the heuristics and the pheromones. In this slide we can just see an example of how the optimum path is reached. In the left side we just see an amp that is starting with the exploration process. We have different paths that are going to go from the SARS, that is marked as F, SARS of food, to the nest that is marked as N. So the end is going to start in the nest. It's going to start following different paths and it's going to try to reach the source of food. When they are reach the source of food, it's going to go back to the nest. Okay, we assume that the ant has found some food and it's coming back. So in the first example, in the left side, we have just a single ant going through the path that is just guiding it. Then once the ant is coming back, there are pheromones and another ants are going to follow those pheromones. In this case, we have the trade-off between exploration and exploitation, which is actually what we are going to define when we give weights to the heuristics. So for example, when the ant is exploring, it's more likely that if you have few, fewer pheromones, you are going to follow any path. Normally, when you initialize the pheromones, you just use a, a, a uniform distribution, so you give the same probability to every path, and you try to make sure that at the very beginning you have a higher exploration because you don't want the end to be exploited in a path from the beginning otherwise there is no learning process you will just go to a local minimum and you won't find you won't find the shortest path so then in the middle we see when ants start to interact we see for example that the paths in the sides in the left side and in the right side have like a fewer number of pheromones which are highlighted by the yellow uh, line. So in this case, the path in the middle is the one that has the higher number of pheromones. Why again? Because this path has more ants going through, is the shortest path, so more ants are going to be leaving pheromones because they are faster in this path, and then at some point it will become the most relevant path. So you see that in the last picture, in the right side, there is only one ant following the side paths, probably an ant that is just exploring for new paths or exploring for new options, but the majority of the ants have already decided a path between the nest and the stars of food. So this will be the final solution, this will be the convergence of the algorithm, and this will be the output that it provides. All these cases have been defined for the problem of a discrete graph. So normally you just have a graph, you have specific nodes, and that is a discrete problem. However, sometimes you want to work with continuous problems. You don't want to have a discrete space. And for that, Zorigo and Shocha develop an algorithm that will move this idea of uncolon optimization for discrete problems to continuous graph. This is actually in this paper called Uncolon Optimization for Continuous Domains, where you can actually see how they pass from the idea of a discrete domain to the extension of a continuous domain. And what's the main idea behind this? Let's have a look. So the main idea to pass from discrete domains to continuous domains is just to use kernels or Gaussian kernels 
whose parameters you are going to optimize with the apps. So basically in this case you should make a decision in a lot of potential paths. So the idea is that the kernel is going to give you a probability distribution of decisions that is going to smooth the graph depending on how you are optimizing the process the parameters of the kernels are going to be the pheromones and this is going to allow you to learn what are the best parameters for the kernel and to define a combination of Gaussian distribution or a Gaussian kernel that is going to allow you to follow a specific path and this is actually used for example in one of the worlds of automatic test generations that is going to try to describe inputs in a continuous domain. Let's go to the second part. Now we want to apply uncolon optimization to automatic test generation. So we want to see how uncolon optimization can help us in software engineering. The first thing that we need to do is to define the problem of automatic test generation. For those who are familiar with uh, testing, you know that normally when you are testing a program, you write the test manually, your unit test in Java or your unit test in C, then you run the test and you have an assertion for the input output. When you are using automatic test generation, what you are trying to do is to cover all the program as much as you can. And there are several different criteria to do that. So for example, you have branch coverage, you have path coverage, etc. etc. The generator is going to generate inputs that are trying to achieve the maximum value for the specific criteria that you are trying to reach. For example, if your criteria is branch coverage, the generator is going to generate inputs or a test suite that is going to increase branch coverage as much as it can. Obviously, during this process, you hope to find the potential bugs that you have in the program and that your tests are going to activate these bugs. So for example, you have a bug in a specific branch you will check the branch and at some point the, the, the bug will be activated so you can just go to that branch, fix it and check all the tests again just to make sure that you are not introducing a new bug. So normally what you do is to run these automatic test generation processes for a long time and if you have found nothing you have a, a kind of confidence that your program is robust. Also, if you can add assertions or you can add some specific criteria for input output when you reach specific branches, you can have a process for verifying some of the behaviors of the program. You can see that testing is quite extended and it allows you to check different aspects of your program. And because it's dynamic, you can also check the performance of the program, which is something that is also very relevant. And the main idea is that testing will allow you to find faults inside of the system so you can fix them. So how do you generate inputs with ANTS? How do you use uncolon optimization to generate inputs? Well, we need to transform the generation process into a search problem. So the ANT can actually search through the different places which will be the most suitable input and we will need to add a concept of pheromones, a concept of graph, etc etc and there are several different options for this so for example you need to think about how you will add on a heuristic you need to think about which is the criteria for the testing process you need to think about how the output is going to be so normally what you do is that you sit down with your team you take up some paper you think about the problem that you want to analyze and then you start thinking about possible solutions once you have defined it as a search process. One of the good things is that there are a lot of search-based software engineering papers that are actually already modeling the automatic test generation process as a search process. And normally your fitness function is either your coverage criteria or any other criteria that you want to target with your test suite. So let's start with the fitness function. So let's think about usual cases when you are trying to increase the coverage of your system. So you have the program, for example here we have a program with six specific blocks and basically what we are doing is that we have 
different branches. So for example, we have a branch between two and three, and another branch between two and four, and two other branches between four and five, and four and six. So the idea is that we will try to cover all these branches. We are doing, for example, branch coverage. So we will need an input that goes between two and three, another input that goes between two and four, an input that goes between four and five, and an input that goes between four and six. In, so an input will probably do the job because, for example, an input can go to between two and three and four and six, and other inputs will do uh, will just cover part of the branch that you want to cover. So the idea in the case of branch coverage would be to try to reach the max the, the maximum number of branches with the hopefully minimum number of inputs. At the same time, if you just want to cover the lines of the program, for example, you just need to generate inputs that are covering every single line. So if one input is not covering so all of the lines, you will generate another input that will cover the rest of the lines. In the case of path coverage, you will try to generate an input per path. So for example, one path will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Another path will be 1, 2, 4, 6. Another path will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 6. And another path will be 1, 2, 4, 5, 6. As possible other paths. But you want to cover all of them. You can imagine that path coverage will be very expensive when you have loops. Because trying to cover every single case of the loop, for example, if the loop is controlled by an input variable, will be very demanding. So for that reason, path coverage is normally discarded. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort. Sometimes what you are trying to do is to reach the maximum branch coverage. So once you have the coverage criteria in mind, this is going to be your fitness function. This is going to be guiding your generation process. And you are going to run different inputs that are going to provide you the values either of branch, line, or path coverage. So how this is going to work? You will have an input domain. You will try to select inputs from the input domain. In this case is where you can apply the search process. The generator is going to run the inputs. It's going to calculate how much you have covered already or how much you are covering with the new input. And it's going to be receiving fitness values about all the test suite. This will be the case of this specific sample that we have here or a specific input. So for example, if you are doing something that is called the whole test suite generator, you are just generating a set of tests, you run the test in your program, you calculate the path, the branches, and the lines that are covered, any of them, or all of them if you want, because you can also have a multi-objective approach. And then you are just giving a value for the test suite. If you find another test suite that is more suitable, in that case, that test suite will be the one that is going to be to replace the previous one. And what you want to do in this case is to decide how to include uncommon optimization in this process. So as I mentioned before, we have different approaches to apply uncommon optimization for test suite generator. So the first approach will be the most classical one. When what you are going to do is to take the whole input state, you are going to generate partitions, and you are going to navigate the partitions as you navigate the ANS graph. So basically, you will also play a little bit with the granularity of this partition in order to make sure that you are reaching all the inputs. The AND is going to navigate its partition, it's going to select tests in its partition, it will to create a test suite, and then according to the values of branch coverage, uh, line coverage, or path coverage, the AND is going to have a specific fitness value. That fitness value is going to be used to fit the pheromone matrix that is going to decide which specific paths of the graph are the most suitable ones and the next hand is going to perform the same process. So you will have the evaporation process too and you will make sure that at some point only the inputs that generate the higher coverage are going to be key. So this paper here from Maud and colleagues it's actually using this approach, it's actually using the whole test suite generator uh, by, via uncolon optimization. So basically what they are doing is what I just explained, they are just creating a set of ones that are trying to find the best test suites to cover the whole program 
according to a coverage criteria. So once you reach the maximum coverage, or once you reach a coverage that is satisfiable according to the number of instances that you have, you just stop the process. Well, obviously everything that I was saying sounds really straightforward, but the devil is in the details. So you might be thinking, oh yeah, it sounds very good, I can just generate ants, I can just generate test cases, run them, get the values of coverage, and voila, I have performed my algorithm. This is fine if you haven't done any testing ever, but let's think about the problems. You have types, you might have strings, you might have methods if you are using object-oriented programming, even with functional programming, you have different function calls. So you need to do an analysis of the code and you need to think a lot about how you're going to test and what are going to be the limitations of your approach because you won't be able to test absolutely everything. Especially if you are trying to work with um, system testing, with network connection, etc., etc. Even the most sophisticated techniques in testing are not going to be able to do that at the moment in terms of automatic test generation. Let's have a look about how this uh, whole test suite generator process works, just to have an idea about the level of complexity and the points that you need to think about when you are trying to do your own testing. So first, we are going to do two kinds of analysis. One is going to be a static analysis on the source code, and the other one is going to be a dynamic analysis. Why do we need to do this static analysis? Why do we need to understand the source code? because we need to understand the types of the variables that are going to be the inputs. We need to understand the whole input set. Without that, we cannot generate inputs. Well, we can generate inputs randomly as we, you do in fuzzing, or you can just manipulate the inputs. But if you really want to generate a test case from zero, you need to do this automatic analysis or this static analysis in order to understand what the system is doing. Actually, in this case, what they are doing is that they take the information from the static analysis to generate the parameters for the ant colony and then they perform local search and global search in order to find the test suite. So this is guided by the pheromones and the pheromones are actually helping them to decide, as I mentioned before in this input space, helping them to decide what is going to be the best solution. However, you still need to do dynamic analysis because if you don't run the program, you don't know what's the specific parent coverage, bad coverage, or line coverage that you are reaching. So you can also do this statically, but it's always better to do it dynamically because you will have the actual value. That is actually what you want to reach. So then you are going to do a dynamic analysis per test suite generated. You can imagine that this is going to be a bottleneck. So once you do this dynamic analysis, you are going to get the specific value of coverage, and this is going to feed the pheromones. This is going to give information about how good that specific ant that has generated the test suite is doing. And then you're going to repeat the process in terms of the optimization until you find a good app, or the best one, or you finish the number of iterations. Problems here, convergence. How do you warranty that actually your, your fitness function is giving you enough information to be able to advance during the search process. Because sometimes you will just reach a plateau and you won't be able to optimize absolutely anything because you are not searching in the right way. Okay, so you need to find fitness functions from coverage that allows you to define a gradient in order to generate the best possible answers. Okay, we check the results for this first paper. We can see that the programs that have been used are actually not, not very big programs. They are not suitable for system testing. They are small programs and some of them are well known. For example, the triangle program. If we compare the different approaches, in this case, in ethic algorithms, PSO, particle swarm optimization, ankle optimization, and search strategy, we can see that the results on the ankle optimization and the particle swarm optimize, optimizer are quite similar. Actually, you, if you think about it, they are quite not similar approaches, or at least they are based on principles of having multiple agents. In contrast, the results of the genetic algorithm, at least in the success rate, is lower than the other two approaches, but the strategy, the set strategy is also 
good. So basically, the resource of anchor optimization are good, better than the others, but still they are quite similar. There is not something that changes a lot. And that's the reason we still need to do research on anchor optimization, because we need to find problems when anchor optimization is going to highlight significantly with respect to the other methodologies. And this already happened before, and it will happen in the same way in automatic test generation once we find a problem where anchor optimization can do better. Okay, so once we started studying uh, the whole test suite generator process, my colleagues, Stan Bruce and David Clark uh, and I, start thinking about how can we use and colon optimization to identify triggers in malware. And actually that was a very interesting problem. However, the interface of and colon optimization for testing software was not yet there for using it with malware. Malware is very sophisticated. Sometimes it takes a lot of time just to understand how how to generate an input from malware, how to analyze it. So we decided to start first trying to understand how on-call optimization was working in general. And as I mentioned before, it was when we identified this problem with the plateaus. When we identified that actually one of the problems of on-call optimization was convergence. And even though we have this good results in some specific pro problems that we just saw in the previous slide, there were some moments when angular optimization was not converging at all. And we start to define Phoenix functions for angular optimization. And for that, we created this paper, Doridus. So Doridus started to, as a process of thinking about how to improve the results of angular optimization when we are trying to reach the best test suite. And even though we start thinking about the approach of whole test suite generator, we were thinking that it wouldn't be enough when you have different kinds of variables like floating point that needs some continuity concepts. So for that reason, we created Doridus based on anchor optimization for continuous domain. But in this case, even if uh, we have this approach that was uh, related to dividing the search space, uh, Dan, who is a very, very smart person, thought that it wouldn't be enough just to try to cover everything at the same time because that wouldn't make the algorithm converge. So we were reading at that time the work of Andrea Curie and this uh, famous paper called MIO, I think it's multiple independent objectives, where he was using an evolutionary approach to test a program. And actually what he was doing is to divide the program into targets. In our case, the targets were branches and try to reach every target in an independent search. Actually, that was very related to finding triggers in malware because we will just have the trigger as one of the targets and we will be able to generate ants that reach that specific target. But in our case, we just divide the whole program into targets and we try to generate and that would reach every target. And we have an archive of tar targets. So for example, if a nun was able to reach more than one, that archive will be clean just because we already have a nun that is reaching that target. And all, what, all the process of searching is basically trying to reach as many targets as possible. So here we have a whole schema of how Doritos works. So we start with the in the procedural control flow graph of the program. So this is going to define branches that we want to reach during the testing process. And we will need to do a specific instrumentation of the program in order to identify which are the targets, where are the targets, and to keep control of how many of them has been reached. So once we do the dynamic process, we will be able to measure whether the target has been reached by the answer we are defining. So we just do a small initialization pro process where we created some ants that are going to be test suites and we just run the ants. We check how many targets have been reached. And once we see the targets that has been reached, we just remove them from the archive of targets. And we have a list of targets that are going to be, uh, that are potentially reached or they are close to be reached. So for example, imagine that target two is one of the branches of the program 
and we have selected target one that is the true branch of that branch so for example if you have an if you have target two that is the false and target one that is the true we run that and we reach the true value then we just see how far we are to reach the false value and for that we just check the condition using what is called an approach level fitness so basically what we are going to do is to check how far we are to change the condition from true to false and we are going to run the target depending on these values the target that is closer to be changed is going to be selected and we are going to close to get the end that is closer to that target at that moment because sometimes maybe the end is not even able to go close to that specific target in that case what we are going to do is to be manipulating the different parameters of a Gaussian that is going to be generating this set of inputs in the same way that we have in the AND color optimization for continuous domain and basically this is going to provide new inputs for the new targets that you want to reach we are going to continue this process until we have the best number of uh, parameters for the Gaussian and we just reach the input the idea is that the Gaussians are going to converge to the false value of the branch so this is going to be like a kind of local search trying to reach a specific target and trying to optimize this kernel in order to reach it so now if we go to the results of Dorilus compared with the whole test suite generator we can see that actually we have increased significantly uh, the time consumed by the algorithms in some of the programs so in this case actually we were not using the Ancolon optimization for the whole test suite generator, we were using Evo Suite, which is using genetic algorithms. And Evo Suite was is one of the most sophisticated te techniques to or, or tools to be more specific to test programs. Inside of Evo Suite you actually have different approaches and different techniques. And the one that we were comparing with was the whole test suite generator, which is very similar to the previous one. So just by comparing we can see that in several cases we were able to improve time and in some cases we were able also to improve coverage so even though the improvement is not significantly as I said because we still need to find problems where Ancolon optimization can highlight with respect to the other algorithms we can still see that there is a small improvement especially in terms of time after this work we were thinking okay but there's something missing this is actually good if you want to do unit testing for some specific methods but there are basic methods is it types basically but what happens if we have object oriented programming and we have sophisticated method calls or sequences of method calls that needs to be followed can we actually generate test cases that can just be a set of method calls that are called one after the other and for that reason we start to develop a new approach based on Ancolon optimization called TACO. So the idea of TACO was that it will be able to test more complex programs and it will be able to create these sequences of test cases based on how different methods are called inside of the program. But then the first question was, okay, we have these targets that we want to reach, we have these programs that we want to test, so we need to keep this idea that we that we have in Doridus about selecting targets but at the same time we will need to synthesize the test so first we select a target let's say that you are doing an that you have a program with an authentication system and after the authentication you can add or remove things you need to pass through the authentication first that will be a set of method calls and then you will be able to go to the adding, removing, etc. that you want to do. So first we will select the target and for that we just define a specific layer that is going to be selecting targets in the program similarly to the instrumentation before. Then you have another layer that is going to try to synthesize this method called and it's going to try to create this hierarchy of methods in a specific order because the order matters. You need to authenticate before you try the method it cannot be done in the previous way because otherwise the dedications would make no sense in your program and finally 
you need to add the parameters of the method calls. So the synthetic program will have parameters and then you will have another layer with ants that is going to select these parameters. So basically this is going to be a free tire system and this is going to be in the main structure of TACO. And actually this structure is going to be respected inside of the mechanism, inside of the tool in the way that I just described. You will have ants deciding which targets are going to be the most suitable to test. Then you have ants deciding which method sequences is going to be most suitable to test in order to reach a specific target. And then you have ants that are going to be more similar to Doritos deciding the parameters for the different methods. So once you create a test suite or a test case, you are going to run it and you are going to get the answer for that specific test suite or test case. And with that information, you will fit all the previous tires in order to improve the reachability of your testing process. So once we finish with this process, we evaluate it in multiple programs from one database called SF100 that has been used with Evo Suite and with other tools. And we tested against Evo Suite again and another tool called Randu. So we were extending the number of programs that we can actually reach because we were having this specific method calls. So when we were measuring, for example, the branch coverage, we were able to see that we were slightly better than the baseline, in our case Randu, but we were not better than Evo Suite. The same with the line coverage or the instruction coverage. However, the complexity was more reasonable than in the other cases. And the problem is that Dorilus was created as part of a project that was developed during six months. So for that reason, EvoSuite, that is a big process that has been developed for at least six or seven years at the moment was able to get better results because it's actually it has a better engineering than or after or a specific tool for angular optimization. Maybe if we can actually include our angular optimization algorithm or, or taco algorithm inside of Torilus, we will be able to reach similar results to the ones that we have in Evo Suite. But this is at the moment future goal. So I'm going to leave you with Carlos that is going to explain the part three and he's going to give you examples of uncolon optimization. Thank you for listening. Hello everyone, I am Carlos Gaviria and I will be in charge of the last part of the tutorial. Our focus will be now on implementing uncolony algorithms in code using Isula, a Java library that I developed. Before discussing Isula, let's set up first our development environment. For this tutorial, we will be using Replit, an online IDE. The registration process is really straightforward. You just go to replit.com sign up and set up new credentials, or you also can reuse the ones you use for Google, GitHub, or Facebook. Now let's take a look on how to do it in our browser. I'm going to open a browser window. As you can see, I'm here on the Replit website. I'm going to click into login because I have already created my Replit account. I'm going to log in using my Google credentials. And well, since I've already do it before, I'll just go directly into my Replit session. And know that we have no projects on Replit yet, but we're going to fix that later. Let's go back to the slides. Once you have access to Replit, you can import the GitHub repository we will explore during this tutorial. Importing the tutorial code into your Replit session, it's really easy. Just go into the repository, the URL is here in the slide, and you click on the Run Replit button. So let's see how to accomplish this. I'm going again to our browser instance. We have Replit here, and I'm going to launch another tab. Oh, there's the tab. I'm going to go into ecop.com, dash captainada triste, and this is the URL 
for repository. We have it right there. And as you can see, we have a button run on Replit here. If we click it, given that we're already logged into Replit, we're going to start importing our code into our Replit session. I'm going to click again into import from GitHub. And this process might take a while. The machines that we have access to using Replit, FreePlan are not that powerful. But basically, the code that we have on GitHub will now be accessible from our Replit session. Let's wait for a bit. You can see now that we have a bash script here called run.sh. We also have a run button here. That what it will do is will call this bash script. This bash script will call a Java class called main.java and it will run the solver. Let's do it right now. Because running the solver can take some time. So let's leave it there running in the background. And now we can go back to the slides. Now that our development environment is ready, let's explore the motivation behind a library like Missoula. And system was one of the first and colony algorithms. As most of the algorithms within the meteoristic, and system is based on a group of artificial ants that build solutions and interchange information using pheromones. In this 1996 paper, authors show that an system is first as effective as double search and two, better than simulated annealing in certain instances of the traveling salesman problem. No later, the same authors proposed and colony system, an improved version of an system. The authors made some improvements to one system to enable the algorithm to scale. Among others, they defined a new node selection policy and they changed the pheromone updating behavior. However, these changes were not that dramatic. If you have a working implementation of an ant system TSP solver, the changes required for building an ant colony system solver shouldn't be extensive. And we believe that many ant colony algorithms share behaviors that can be encapsulated in reusable software components. Isula provides Java implementations of these components for users to incorporate into their own algorithms. Now, let's explore this reutilization potential with two implementations of ACO and colony solvers for the TSP. So what we have right now is our solver using an system for the TSP. It's a solver built using Isula. And we're going to explore this online in the web editor provided by GitHub. So now we have here. So this is our main class using an system. Now, let's take a look at the main class using an colony system. We're going to also launch our online IDE within GitHub. This is my ant colony system implementation. I'm going to copy it and I'm going to compare it with the one available for ant system. There it is. I'm going to launch the comment palette, compare with clipboard, and we can see now. So now like to the left, we have the clipboard, which is an colony system. And to the right, we have our an system implementation. And we can see like there's a lot of reutilization between these two algorithm implementation. So we can see like Problem representation code was used as is from an system to a colony system. Thermal initialization, which is done here, it's we're using the same class. Thermal evaporation, again, we're using the same class. But we have made some changes regarding how thermal is updated. You can see here there are some changes. And the rule for selecting nodes within a candidate solution for ants. So there are some changes here. So as you can see, the potential for utilization is, is there. Let's go back to the slides. So solving optimization problems with Isula requires extending or just reusing the classes available in the library. 
three of these classes are especially important. The environment class represents problem information. For example, for a TSP solver, it can contain the coordinates of each city and how to calculate the distance between cities. So let's go back to our TSP solution. Let's explore our and system implementation, and we can see that we have a TSP environment class. In this case, we have developed a TSP environment class tailored for travel incident problem. Now, back to the slides. Another plan is the class is the AND class. The AND represents the agent that build candidate solutions. Going back to our TSP example, is in this class where we calculate the total distance of a path built by an ant, and we keep track of the cities visited so far. Let's again move back to our TSP solver, and we see here that we have developed an ant class for the TSP solver. Let's go back to the slides. And another like key class in Isula is the problem solver class here that orchestrates algorithm execution. It coordinates solution construction and keeps track of the best solution over time. While the environment and classes usually require extensive customization, most of the time the problem solver can be used as is. And we can see this in our TSP solver. Well, we have a customized AND for TSP, and we have a customized environment for TSP. The ACO problem solver type is used as is directly from the library. So in this case, we don't require to tailor it. You can if you need it, but in most cases you don't. Back to the slides. And another key element of Isula is that users can also tailor solution construction by adding demon actions and end policies to the problem solvers. For example, we have demon actions for form an update and end policies for node selection. Let's take a look at this in code. Back to our TCP solver, we can see that we have added some demon actions for initializing thermal matrix values, for evaporating pheromone, and the no selection policy is added here. So we access the solver, then the end colony, and then we add an, an policy. In this case, we're using this component as is without further customization. Back to the slides. And that's all the Isula uh, theory will cover today. And I think now it's time to move into practice. In this tutorial, we will implement a solver for the Unicode set covering problem based on the AND system algorithm proposed by Silva and Ramal. You can see the paper there. And it's an adaptation of the algorithm and system we saw before, but now move to the set covering domain. So now let's do a quick recap of the set covering problem. In this problem, given that we have a collection of elements and we have a collection of sets, that partially cover these elements, our goal is to find a minimal collection of sets such that all of these elements are covered. To make this more concrete, so let's imagine we need to determine in which city to place some fire stations. I think on the slide, if we place a fire station in CT1, it can also serve CT2. You can see this in this diagram. Station one, which is placed in CT1, can support CT1 and CT2. If we place a station in CT2, it can serve CT1, 2, and 3. We can see here also on the slide, station 2 placed on CT2 can support three cities, CT1, CT2, CT3. If we place a station in CT3, here we have station 3, we can cover CT3 and CT4. And if we do this in CT4, we can cover CT4 and CT5. So in this set covering setting, our goal could be to minimize the number of fire stations so we can cover all of these five cities. In this case, the solution is to place two fire stations, one at CT2, another one at CT4. 
we can see that with CT2, we cover these three cities over here, CT1, CT2, and CT3. And with an station in CT4, we cover four and five. So we have accomplished coverage. Now, for this tutorial, we will use a bit more complex instance. We will use a product instance from a Gecko competition on Unico set covering solvers. In Replit, if you go to the data folder, you will find a text file named ac underscore zero one underscore cover dot txt. Let's show this on Replit. This is here. Here it is, our Replit instance with our imported project. We see that we have a data folder and inside here we have three instances. We're covering in detail the solution of this one, AC underscore zero one. And there you have it. Now we can see like in the first line, and let's go back to the slides to discuss this. We have 605 elements to cover 2,904 sets to use. We have this information here. Now in the next line, we are indicating that we're going to discuss the first element with index zero. This is element with index zero. And in the next line, we state that this element is covered by 237 sets, which sets the sets that are listed here in the next line. Then for the next element, uh, another one from this 605, the index is one and this element is covered for by 187 sets, which we're not seeing it on the slide, but we can see it on Replit. And the next line we have all the sets that cover element of index one. For element of index two, 166 sets, that are detailed here. And we do this for all these 105 elements. This is our problem instance that we will try to solve. Back to the slides. Given that this is the setting, let's discuss our Isula solver. All right. I think this is better to be discussed within Replit. So we have our class called and this ACO set covering. So let's take a look at this class. First of all, we're seeing a similar structure of what we saw for TSP. We have an environment type for representing problem information. We have a configuration type where we will store the parameters. And algorithms have parameters like number of ants, heuristic importance, evaporation rate. This information is stored in this configuration instance. We have a tailor-made ant colony type, which will be in charge of instantiating ants and creating them. We have our problem solver type. Again, like in TSP, we're using the problem solver type as is. We are not customizing it. We have some demon actions and we have some AND policies as well. So all this code here is for algorithm configuration. For executing this routine, we call the solve problem method. And after it finishes, we can call the get the solution to obtain the solution found by our AND colony algorithm. Let's go back to the slides. Now let's check how our code implements what's stated in Ramallah's paper. And we start by the pheromone update policy. In this slide, there's an excerpt from the paper stating that pheromone update requires two steps. First, we evaporate the pheromone associated to a solution component. For set covering, solution components are the indices of the candidate sets. And then for each ant, we add an amount of pheromone to each solution component. That is a factor of the quality of the solution built. To accomplish this, we rely on two demon actions, 
and we're seeing the demos actions here that are added to the solver. These demo actions are the default implementation provided by this tool. We have perform of operation and offline pheromone update. The pheromone update policy depends on two parameters, the operation ratio rho and the pheromone deposit factor Q. We set these values in our configuration class. So let's take a deep look at our configuration class now. So we have it here. We'll discuss this in detail later, but I want you to take a look that we have a method for producing the get heuristic important. And we have another method for get pheromone deposit factor. Uh, with that, let's go back to the slides. Now, let's discuss the node selection policy. And again, on this slide, we have an excerpt from the paper that states that the ant selects solution components at random. The probability of selecting a component depends on the pheromone value assigned to this component, which is represented by tau in the slide, and the heuristic value of this component, which is represented by eta in the paper. So Isula provides an ant policy that implements the behavior and is called random node selection. During selection construction, this class has access to the artificial ant, so it can obtain the set of feasible candidate components and its corresponding pheromone and heuristic values. And you're seeing here, we're providing the random node selection and policy to our solver. And we do need to provide some parameter for the policy to work. We have a pheromone importance parameter beta and a heuristic importance parameter alpha. They can be both set up in our configuration class. And let's take a look at that. Again, we have a method in our configuration class for heuristic importance. We see now the value is 1.5. And for pheromone importance, now we see the value is 4. Two slides. And now let's discuss the code intensive parts of our solver. As mentioned before, any problem related information should be placed in an environment instance. This instance will be accessible to the artificial ants and demon actions so they can query for any problem related information. And also the environment instance is responsible for storing the pheromone matrix. In Isula, the default implementation of pheromone matrices are to the arrays. It works well, for example, on TSP instances. However, for set covering instances, Romalo proposes to store pheromones directly on the candidate sets. And to implement this, we need to override the create pheromone matrix method to produce a 2D array with only one column. So you see here on the slide, here we have the create pheromone matrix. And we are producing a 2D array, but in name only. So we have one row per set, but we have only one column. And now let's go to Replit to take a deep look into our environment class, which is here. So this class should store problem-related information. And we have three attributes representing our problem. The number of sets, the number of elements, remember this information is already available in our problem file. And we have here this attribute called elements per set, which is a hash map. The key is the set and the value is a lead of elements that this set's covered. Now, this is not exactly how it's expressed in our problem files. In our problem files, we have an element and the sets that cover that element. So when we were reading the file, we implement some logic to obtain this information, the information that I want. And we will see later when we cover the AND class that having the information organized this way makes the implementation of the AND code way easier. So if you're interested on like the, the parsing problem of transforming 
this txt file into this environment instance, you can take a look at this process data file method. Now back to the slides. Okay. Another is a class that requires customization is the ant colon class. So the responsibility is to instantiate the artificial ants, and these ants will be the ones that will create the candidate solutions. In Ramalo's paper, there's an extra step to take into account when instantiating ants. They should be distributed randomly among the candidate sets. To accomplish this, we override the create ants method. You see here, this create method is overriding in our ant colony for set covering instance. Now, note that the information regarding candidate sets can be extracted from the environment instance. Again, as I mentioned before, the environment instance will navigate among all the classes within an ISOLA implementation. And as you see, create and has direct access to the environment. Now let's look at how we accomplish this random setting among the sets. Let's go to Replit. Let's go to our ant colony class, which is here. Now look. So given that we have access to the environment instance, we can access all of the sets because these are the keys of our hash map that we discussed before. From this set IDs, we pick one at random. And this set that we picked at random, we're going to pass it to our instance of and for set covering. Another thing to note is like this customized and colony produce our customized type for the ads. Now back to the slides. Okay. Now let's talk a bit about the AND class, which is the largest class we have worked on this over. This class needs information to be able to construct candidate solution. And all these methods are going to provide it. So first we added an extra attribute called elements covered to keep track of the elements we cover given the sets we add to our candidate solution. You can see here, elements covered is a new Boolean array that will have the size of the number of elements to cover. To maintain this Boolean array up to date, we have overridden the visit node method and added some extra logic. From the environment instance, we obtain the elements covered by the set we just added to our candidate solution. Then we mark these elements as covered in the elements covered array. You can see this visit node is overridden. So we call the implementation from the parent class, but then in these two lines, we implement this custom logic. So given a set that I'm going to add to my solution, I get all the elements covered by this set, and I will mark them as covered in my elements covered Boolean array. This is accomplished here. We have also added the get and covered elements method that produces which elements are still pending to cover in our candidate solution. We have it here, which what I basically do in this method is I traverse this elements covered array and I will produce the IDs of the elements that haven't been covered yet. This information is important to obtain the heuristic value of a solution component that we will see on the next slide. Well, let's continue our AND class exploration. Here in the slide, we have an excerpt from Ramalo's paper describing how to obtain the heuristic value for a candidate set. It is the proportion of new elements covered by the set if we include the set into an AND solution. We use the uncovered elements from the method we discussed before to obtain all dependent elements and use the environment instance to obtain the elements covered by a candidate set. Then we calculate the intersection and divide this value by the total number of elements. So let's look at here, get heuristic value, it's already written, and we're implemented what the Ramalo paper is saying. So we first obtain, what are the elements I haven't covered yet? What are the elements covered by the sets I plan 
to add to my solution. I get the interception and I divide it by how many elements do I need to cover? And all that logic is here. Now, in this slide, we have more methods from the ant class. The A solution ready method signals the ant colony when artificial ants has finished building a solution. In our case, we'll use the get and cover elements method to know when there are no more elements pending. You can see the solution ready. And what I do is I obtain all uncovered elements and I calculate how many of them are and I check if it's zero or not. Now, our problem is an instance of the Unicode set covering problem, meaning that the cost of including a set in the solution is one. Given that our get solution cost returns the size of the list containing the solution, we can see get solution cost. As a parameter, we have the solution built so far. It's producing a double, which is like really an integer corresponding to the size of this list. And although we have demon actions for controlling pheromone dates, in Isula, the AND class is the one responsible for making pheromone deposits. The set pheromone trail value has the logic to update a cell in our one column to the matrix. So we have this set pheromone trail value. We have as a parameter the ID of the sets. We have as a parameter also the value. How much should I update this, the pheromone related to this set? And this information most likely comes from a demon action. And then here is just the logic. So how to alter the thermal matrix with this value. Okay, enough of the AND class, let's move to the configuration class. It implements the AND system configuration provider interface that contains a method for each parameter typically associated to AND system algorithms. We have within Isula similar interfaces for AND colony system, for maximum AND system, and any other AND colony algorithm. Now, the Romalo paper suggests using 150 ants for solving set covering instances. But we're using the Replit free plan that gave us around half a virtual CPU and one gig of memory. So we cannot use these values. Well, you can try if you want, you probably clash. So we're using 10 ants now, but feel free to experiment. Replit is there for you too play. So if you want to play with these values, you can go to your configuration class, change whatever you want, take the wrong method and see if it works or not. Slides. No, results. So the AC01 instance from the Gecko competition has an optimal value, and that value is seven. There's a solution of size seven. Now let's take a look how good we did. Go back to Replit, here's the execution. We started this tutorial with, and where our solution cost is nine, haven't reached the optimal solution. It took for this uh, algorithm run 200 seconds, because that's not bad. And you probably will have a different solution. The algorithm is random. So many runs can produce different values. We can see we started with a solution of cost 16. And it went down and down and down. And it was kind of stuck on nine. Now, if you want better results, well, I would suggest to run this in your computer, which is way more powerful than Replit. Change the parameter and see if you can reach seven. Let's go back to the slides. That finishes our exploration of the set covering problem. Now let's explore some of the components available within Sula. As we mentioned before, we have permanent update demon actions and no selection policies for both an system and an economy system. And you got them here. We use them in this tutorial for PSP, we show them, and the AND system one will reduce them for set covering. 
It will also support the iterated ANTS algorithm where ANTS start, start with parse solutions. So in iterated ANTS, uh, ANTS work over a parse solution. So we have an ANT type that supports this and we have an ANT policy for constructing these partial solutions. In maximilian system, we have from update policy that enforce a range. So in maximilian system, we have a minimum for one value and a maximum for one value. So we have admin action and an ant policy that enforces this range. We also have support for parallel and colony algorithms. We have a problem solver that supports multiple and colonies generating solutions in parallel. So if you use this parallel ACO problem solver and you have a system that has multiple CPUs, this solver can expand threads and assign independent colonies that can like uh, take advantage of the multiple CPUs to generate more solutions in the same time. And all these components are available within the library and ready to be incorporated to your own and colony algorithms. Now, before finishing this tutorial, I want to mention that besides the traveling solvent problem and the unicost covering, we have also developed Isula based solvers for the flowshop scheduling problem, image thresholding, and image clustering. These implementations have and an environment classes that you can reuse in case you are approaching these same problems. So well, that's all for me. Uh, to recap, Isula takes advantage of the reusability potential of ant colony algorithms. Um, we as a team were constantly updating the Isula library, we're incorporating new algorithms and solving new problems. Isula was designed to be extensible and we're always open to contributions and suggestions from the community. Please visit our GitHub page for any comment or feedback. And thank you very much for your attention.